Um, this is what I was given to talk about. Um, I made a sort of subtitle. This is a Prezi, by the way. So if you're not seeing Prezi's, they tend to sort of fly in and out a little bit. And I, I just find it a bit more fun to create than um, PowerPoints. So I've called it a tale of two charts because an awful lot of charts get created by us, both in terms of our uh, reports and our publications and a lot come across my desk. And I thought a different way of looking at what we do might be just to pick out a couple of charts, which I thought have been quite so confronting or interesting this year. Take you through them, see how we got there and where we go in the future. Um, obviously, I pinched my title from uh, Dickens's book, which was 160 years ago, talking about times which are about 80 or 90 years earlier. And if anyone, it's one of the more famous opening quotes of a book. In researching or preparing for this, it's actually one sentence. So it's a, probably one of the longest sentences to actually open up a book um, to ever go. And it's also interesting because it's, it's still pretty relevant to today. You could actually say anything on that is very applicable to what's going on, particularly, say, in the UK or with the uh, current president of the United States. So moving on, um, these are the two charts, and we're going to go into them in a little bit more detail shortly. But I thought I'd go for the processes. The surgeons in the room will know how we get all the data in the, uh, the BASM reports or in the ANZASM reports, but everyone else won't. So I thought we'd just take you through the process of how we collect all this data. And we start off, obviously, someone has to die under the care of a surgeon. That is notified to us from various sources. And a form is sent out to the surgeon to complete and this is the paper form. Now, we don't actually want paper forms now. We want them all done on uh, the surgeon's interface, but the paper form is much easier to show you than the interface. So this is the paper form, and there's a whole lot of demographic questions. When did the patient die? When were they admitted? Um, uh, obviously, what sex they were, what age they were, what uh, sort of uh, surgery they were having uh, done, uh, ASA status, and various other bits and pieces. I'm not going to go through all of this, but... Basically, you can see from all of this that there is a lot of data that we're collecting. Might not necessarily all be filled in, and we'll come back to that shortly, but uh, we expect a certain amount of information to be created so that we then have a lot of data sets and we can send this information off. So we're collecting all this sort of stuff. The surgeon is also asked, did they think anything went wrong themselves? So they can self-report and say, yeah, there was a disaster here, or I'm a bit concerned about what went on. And they're also asked to reflect uh, would they have done anything different? Which is filled in very, very invariably and not very uh, satisfactorily, but again, we'll come down to that. So we have all this information. We then send it off for an assessment. And the first line assessment is usually, or it is always, someone from the same specialty but a different hospital. And they go through the information given by the surgeon and are basically asked, did you think anything went wrong with this? Was it okay? Wasn't it okay? And particularly, should we look for what we call a second line assessment, where it is then sent off for a second surgeon in the same specialty, but from a different hospital, to review the hospital notes. So this is when the hospitals are informed, they're asked to pull out the notes, and a much more in-depth report is created. So from that, the interesting thing we, we're looking at really is, was there a clinical management issue? And we classify our clinical management issues in three ways. Area consideration, basically, there might be a, a, a different point of view. Something could have been done differently, may probably wouldn't have made much difference to the patient's journey. Area of concern, something probably went wrong, and an adverse event, something definitely went wrong. And then we can further classify this down to was it preventable and was it involved in the patient's death? So that's the sort of, the, the, the sort of interesting area of where we get on this. This is surgeons criticizing surgeons. All covered by qualified privilege, of course, so you can say what you like. So going back to that, the information is then sent on back to the original surgeon, and they have the right to appeal. So if they disagree with it, they can ask for a further second-line assessment. Very, very few do, and then the case is closed. But the other thing we do do from it is we create a whole load of de-identified data, which is what we use for our reports and for our publications. So this is the first chart, and what this is is a tucky box plot. Um, so... I know we're not all statisticians here, but what we're looking at in the boxes, the thick line in the box is the median. And the white and gray are non-indigenous patients, and the colored ones are indigenous patients throughout the country. And this is when they have died over the last 10 years. I think the confronting thing about this, and we're looking at this in a lot of detail at the moment, is there's no change. So over 10 years, despite all the resources that are being thrown into this, the indigenous population is still dying from surgery 
10, 15 years earlier than the non-indigenous population. And the whiskers on the charts are, the boxes go between the 25th and the 75th percentile. So half the numbers are represented by the colors in the box and the whiskers represent 1.5 times the interquartile range. So you've got an awful lot, it's not actually an awful, it's quite small numbers, but there are kids dying from operations uh, in the indigenous population where they're not dying in the non-indigenous population. And this goes hand in hand what was released last week by the government, um, that all this money that's going into particularly healthcare for the indigenous population isn't making that much of a difference at the moment. So I think that's a brilliant chart, but it's very confronting. And of course, it begs the question, what can we do to improve it? As a mortality audit, audit, we can't do particularly much. We can release that and say, this isn't good enough. And we will be releasing that. Um, but as an audit, we can't do that much more about it. What we can do though, and this is gonna be released in the charts as well, some of the data just isn't being collected. And this shows that apart from Northern Territory, there's a whole, the black boxes there represent that the, we haven't actually collected whether they were indigenous or not, which is an incredibly basic question. And it's something that everybody should be asked when they're coming into hospital because there are financial implications and all sorts of things to do. But most, all the states apart from the Northern Territory aren't getting that information out. So we've got to get the information better. Because it's like with all databases, it's rubbish in, rubbish out. And we've got to get the, the basics right. This is my second one, and uh, this is a bit closer to home. This is Victoria. Um, what we have here, we've seen a few funnel plots, which David was showing earlier. Um, this is preventable uh, clinical management issues um, related to number of deaths. So the bottom line is the number of deaths per hospital. So you're going to logarithmic scale. So the, the, uh, the ones to the right are the, the big performing hospitals. Basically, if you're getting 100 plus deaths over three years, you're going to be quite a big hospital going down to some hospitals that have zero deaths. And what the uh, chart does is enable you to separate those out. Because obviously, if you have a small hospital, you have one death and something went wrong, it's going to show up as 100%. That's not going to be good. So um, the funnel plots allow a certain amount of uh, stretching out of the data. And the dotted, the uh, but the sort of lower line there represents 95%. So uh, there are 5% outliers and the dotted line represents 99.8. So the crucial thing for that is you can see that there are two hospitals which seem to be outliers. And to put it in sort of layman's <coughs> terms, the risk of them not being an outlier is about one in 500. Whereas if you're in the 95%, above 95% interval, the risk of you not being an outlier is about one in 20. So with all statistics, there's always a possibility that it's just chance. So the more and more you get your confidence intervals up there, the less and less the, what you're seeing is due to chance. So what we've got there is two hospitals where we're saying something's going on, they're flagging. And that's over three years data. I think what's reassuring from all of this and uh, all the talks I do, do give is to say that surgery is generally pretty safe. So the big hospitals, the ones that are doing lots and lots of cases aren't flagging, they're, they're doing pretty well. Um, we can also create data for one year. It becomes less significant because the numbers are smaller, but you, on that one, we've got a, a number of outliers there. So we can monitor these sort of things from year to year. And if a particular hospital is continually being an outlier, we can possibly take that further forward. So that becomes then the question, if we go back to this, anyone looking at that chart will say, well, I want to know what those two hospitals are. And I don't particularly want my relatives going to have an operation in those hospitals. Unfortunately, we can't tell you that. And that's one of the limitations of uh, the QP that we're working under. We'll be discussing a little bit about QP shortly. Um, but equally, it's fairer to tell the hospitals rather than sort of the, the, the uh, go to public at the moment. So what can we do? And what do we do? The individual surgeons are given the information to start with. So they are told, yes, there's a problem. And if, okay, they're not going to admit it to anybody if the report says you cocked up here, you did something horrible, which most of them don't. Most of these things are multi-system errors. But if their report, and quite a few of them do say, it's fairly obvious that something went wrong in a systematic way in your hospital, the surgeons can go to their own hospital and say, look, I've had this report. It's saying we need to look into our processes in the organization. I'd be very surprised if many surgeons do that, but they can. 
They, they've got ownership of their own reports. The other thing we do is we do produce reports ourselves, which are de-identified. So these sorts of charts I've shown you are stuck into the reports, and the reports are available for everybody to read. They're out there on the internet if you do want to look at them. And before the reports go out, we do produce individual organization and hospital reports. And what they do is go through all the uh, data that we collect and say how that hospital, how your hospital compares with a like hospital, both in the state and nationally. So you can see if you're performing as well as your peers as a hospital. So the hospitals are given, possibly not quite as confronting as that chart there, your number so-and-so in on that chart, but they are given a clue, a fairly big clue, that they might be an outlier in certain areas. And that's the sort of charts they get. This is just one of the random hospitals I work at, which actually did very well. So uh, there's no major issues there. Then becomes a the question, should we do more? And from that, can we do more? And I think this comes into the, the qualified privilege angles. At the moment, we can't. Any information we get, we can't actually name names. And we, we probably shouldn't be able to. But we can pass the information on to the VPCC. And if there are particular big problems, we can possibly go a little bit higher than that. But the most information has to go back to the hospitals. And we have to say to them, look, you're not doing so well here. And the, the great thing about doing annual charts is we can hopefully see that the outliers come back into the fold. I think crucial to all of this is the data um, and getting the data timely. And I think this is one of the issues that we have had in VASM in that it takes a while to get the surgeons to do the uh, reports or do the, the case forms. Uh, I think as of today, 20% of the last year's data hasn't had its forms back yet. So we're not getting the reports back in a timely fashion. We're sometimes not getting our assessor's reports back. And we are also struggling sometimes to get the hospital notes back. So there's all sorts of delays built into the system. So that last week I was going over deaths from 2016, 2017. And I don't think that's really good enough. I think we've, we've got to pull our socks up on that one. And hopefully, in certainly in terms of the surgeon data, the this is the database, this is the surgeon's interface. I think putting the information to this will give us a lot better and hopefully a lot easier information. Uh, we were at a meeting last week with all the other clinical directors and we're hoping that we can make this so that certain data just has to be filled in. It won't be accepted unless we get all the data that we want. It's like filling in your tax return or anything else like that, any important data. If you don't obviously send the form in, then you're not signed off for CPD, so it has all sorts of implications. So we can fiddle with this and we can get better data, which will hopefully enable us to pass that information on and we can learn a little bit more from it. I think crucial things in all of this is we're not alone. We do work uh, collaboratively, both in the national sense with all the other ASMs across the country and also, as we've seen today, with VAHI and Safer Care Victoria through the Department of Health. And I think our relationship with the VPCC is going to be critical in the future. I think David's got a little bit more power than we have, so he'll be able to get surgeons to, as he said, get our, uh, our forms back to us in a quicker way with certain little gentle threats. And he also has the power to eventually go to the Minister of Health and say, look, there is a problem. And that's going to be, I think, help the audits along as well. Um, I've got to thank, because I've rattled through this fairly quickly, Jess has helped with a lot of the work here. I don't think Jordan's here today, but she's doing all the work on the Indigenous thing. And Ryan produced the beautiful charts, which I have shown for you today. Um, that's the sort of VASM team as it was a little while ago. We're, we're changing quite rapidly at the moment. Um, and my sort of final slide is audits do make a difference. 